Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session with a very intriguing title, Banks for Better World. My name is Mariela Tanasova. I'm part of the innovation team at SWIFT and InnoTribe, and I will be your facilitator today with pleasure. The person who stays really behind this session and who designed it all is sitting right here at the front, and I will introduce her immediately, Martine de Wiert. Thank you, Mela. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mela, my colleague, is actually going to facilitate this session uh, for us, but uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about this session and why we actually decided to put it together. Um, it all started in 2008 when SWIFT actually wrote its CSR strategy. And we had two main legs to this strategy. The first one is we wanted to have CSR internally first, because you always have to start with your internal kitchen, make sure that there is employee engagement, that everybody believes in, in the CSR approach and so forth. And I think we have managed to do that. Amongst others, we decided to reduce our CO2 emission by 60%, and we have achieved 37% of that already. So we're getting there, and we get more and more employees engaging. Then, last year at Cybos, 2010, it was actually a session about sustainability in business. That was the kickoff. And during that session, and unfortunately I wasn't there, but my understanding is that what was actually concluded, because at first the banks thought that maybe we would share best practices and so forth, there was no appetite for sharing best practice. That is already something that's happening in various groups. But there was definitely an appetite for coordinated action. And the banks that gathered during this interactive session last year had actually decided that this should go further. So, 2011, June, we, SWIFT, InnoTribe, we get involved in a conference which is organized by an organization called Ashoka. Ashoka, by the way, means absence of sorrow. I really like that title. Who are they? Social entrepreneurs. The organization has been in existence for 30 years, and it's all social entrepreneurs actually gathering. We met amazing people there. Amongst others, somebody who lives in Africa and actually trains rats to detect mines. We had a person that has actually created a company and they employ autistic people because these people have amazing skills, eye for detail and so forth, and he actually employs them and actually sends them as consultants to other companies. We met African women that are fighting for their country, for, for, for poverty, for everything. It was just an amazing experience. Mariela and I, and I don't know if Dominique is in the room somewhere, several of us were there, and we actually decided to organize a Banks for Better World session. There were only a few banks there because of the environment, but there were a few. But we had many social entrepreneurs. And so these people actually helped us define and identify some of the challenges. And what we heard from most of them is that they have a problem getting funding. Because there is microcredit, but then there's big loans, but there is sometimes nothing in the middle. So we need to actually think about potentially how we could address that. And now we're here today, Toronto, Cybos 2011. And we have decided to organize this session. Now, I don't know where we're going with this, but in our tribe, as usual, we have interactive approach. We are going to build this together and we are going to try and define whether we want to go anywhere with this initiative. And if so, what is it going to be about? Okay, so we will just, through exercises that we will do with you, actually decide or not that we want to collaborate and see if there is collaborative space at the level of the industry to actually do something around this area. But I think I'd like now to share with uh, Thierry Touché, who was with us at Ashoka, uh, Thierry Touché is director of the International Polar Foundation. So Thierry, uh, are you going to do this sitting or do you want no, to no. stand up? I'm going to stand up. I have a microphone. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Thierry Touché and uh, uh, we were part of that exercise. The foundation uh, is a private foundation and uh, we are partners of SWIFT and we have been partners of SWIFT for the past uh, two years. 
uh, our mission is uh, to discuss about science, uh, science about polar regions, about climate and about sustainability. And that is where we fit uh, with uh, SWIFT as far as being actors and facilitators of a greater community. So in uh, the uh, presentations uh, that we did, we participated in uh, Cybos uh, in Amsterdam. We had a workshop there uh, with the banks in uh, doing good is uh, good for business. Uh, we also participated in InnoTribe and the foundation has some itself, some innovative ways of uh, doing things. Uh, and we also uh, contributed to the Ashoka exercise. So in Ashoka, uh, there was a uh, work, uh, you have those whiteboards here. So people would gather in groups and uh, write uh, what should be uh, a bank, what should be, oh. this, let's see. Is that the feedback, uh, those uh, screens there? No. Okay, let's, uh, we'll do it. We'll do it without the slides, that's okay. And um, in, in Ashoka, so we had that work on the uh, whiteboards, which was a follow-up of uh, the InnoTribe session of Amsterdam a year ago, exactly. And uh, the last part of the day in Ashoka, the afternoon, was or could look, if uh, we look at the pictures, more like a kindergarten kind of exercise. Uh, you had the grown-up people who were given uh, tools uh, those were part, I mean, all kinds of trinkets, you know, uh, which uh, w in a bag on the table. And the challenge was in uh, about an hour to imagine in a 3D model with what you were given, how to represent uh, what you had done in a formal manner on a whiteboard in the morning. And uh, there were six groups uh, from the top of my head. And uh, those six groups came with uh, shapes and concepts which were all uh, extremely different in uh, the, the look of the 3D, but which all had the common uh, vision and the common message with terms like value and values. So we're talking about profit and social uh, involvement. Uh, we had things like the wheel of fortune, but not uh, the wheel, uh, the wheel, W-I-L-L, -L, the wheel of fortune. We had uh, going, uh, going beyond and above, uh, which means uh, jump a little out of the traditional uh, framework and thinking process of uh, the banks and uh, look forward to another range of customers that uh, they do not reach to, uh, but which also could bring profit, maybe lesser profit, but bring profit. And uh, I guess I can show you some pictures now. Uh, I will just breeze quickly through those because I say that already. And uh, we'll go to the, this is a, an example of the table where uh, people were uh, really being creative. And uh, I, I must say that, including the table I was, and all tables, for the first 10 minutes, everybody was uh, scratching their heads and say, how do we do that? What are we doing here? And so on. And then the momentum started, uh, the momentum really built up. And at the end, each team had to make the presentation of its own creation, the 3D model. So this is the formal, which I would leave uh, Martin comment. But this is actually a slide that uh, a report from last year's session at Cybos. Yes. Where so this, there's work that has been done about this already. We're not starting from scratch. Where we were trying to determine what's part of the collaborative space and what is proprietary. Because of course all of your institutions have their own TSR program. You have your own philanthropy and so forth. So we need to be very clear about what can be in the collaborative space and what is out of the collaborative space. I don't want to go through this slide, but you can see that we've got a good basis to start from. Yeah, it is serious work. And then we had those models. So the one on the left is the uh, value and values bank. Uh, the one on the right is the wheel of fortune bank. And uh, you also have uh, uh, one where SWIFT was still part of the system, even though the bank was totally different. And uh, the one on the right there is the above and beyond. Uh, and you may see one of those little uh, um, Bell. bells, this, like this, which is underneath, which if the system falls, uh, it makes an alarm before the system crashes totally so that people can react before it crashes. Uh, anyway, this, this is the introduction. Uh, I guess uh, the exercise we're going, go, going through today, uh, you're not going to get trinkets and uh, being asked to make the 3D models, but it is in the spirit 
of what was done both at InnoTribe a year ago and at Ashoka. And as the foundation, uh, we are really happy to contribute. Uh, our contribution is from a, a way of thinking differently and contributing to InnoTribe, being innovative and looking uh, one or two generations beyond 2050, 2080, get a nice model, and then we'll all figure out how, how we get there, which path we take to get to that beautiful model. Thank you. I would like to give you a little back step, actually, and read through the rules that we came up with at Ashoka. So the exercise we did there was based on a few very, very specific rules that we believe can create a different kind of financial system. And these they are. The banking system is a key contributor to a sustainable society. That's rule number one. Success balances social impact and profit. The two have to be there. Inclusion means everyone can play. What the system does with value is transparent. And the most important one, there is value outside of money. This has been a recurring theme over this day and even the days before in this room, that value is not contained only in money, but in many different things. So the kind of exercise we're going to go through is going to look at how we can actually deal with other kinds of value. This is going to be an interactive session, but we have invited a number of people here to inspire you in your work. And these people have all a story to share. They have all looked at the social banking system that is emerging and the current banking system mainstream that we have and they have found that there are some problems, that there are some needs. And each one of them has a story to share of how they personally have picked a different way of addressing those needs. I'm going to introduce all of them in one go and they will tell their story one after the other. Alain Dres, who was a colleague of ours, and who is now the founder of Bamboost, and he will tell you everything about it. Bruce Cahan, who is um, the founder of Urban Logic, and who is organizing something called Good Bank. And that's what his story is going to be about. And Stan Stalnecker, finally, from Hub Culture and Venn, who is the founder, shall we say, of the Venn currency. And he will share his story about alternative currencies. I'm going to give the floor to them, and afterwards I'll explain what we're going to do with their stories. Thank you, Mariela. Um, before I talk about Bamboost, I want to say a couple words about how I got to that. I was born and raised in Haiti, and I always kept in the back of my mind that someday, someday, I would do something for that community of people that I love that actually do everything they can to survive, to live, to be happy. I kept that in the back of my mind and, and did thousands of things that had nothing to do with that. Did some research in physics. I did some operations research consultant. I was consultant at McKinsey for a few years. I worked in Swift for 10 years in marketing and sales. And in the back of my mind, but really far in the back of my mind, someday I'll do something. And um, there was the earthquake in Haiti last year. And I said, well, maybe I ought to grow up, stop saying that someday I would do something, and actually do it. So I, I contacted a few ex-colleagues from McKinsey who had gone in microfinance and tried to learn a few things about that, and uh, came up with the help of some of them and people that I've been introduced to, in, in particular Vincent Burgui, came up with that concept. And that concept comes from basically three observations. First observation is that there are too many talented entrepreneurs in the developing countries that fall in a structural gap. Structural gap in terms of financing, but also in terms of support. They're between the microfinance and the traditional investors. They're looking for equity somewhere between 10,000 and half a million. There are also too many skilled individuals, skilled professionals, that want to devote some time, a small amount of time, they don't want to change their lives, and that could really support these entrepreneurs. They can't find the opportunities. It's really tough to give two or three hours per month efficiently. And you also have too many social investors, philanthropists, 
that struggled to find reliable mid-sized projects they could support. And all these people want to do things and are stuck. And if we could find a way to pull them together and to give them the working space to collaborate, they could help each other and actually deliver. Well, Bamboost is about that. Bamboost is an online community. It's an online community that aims to assist the entrepreneurs, the community itself, not Bamboost, to assist the entrepreneurs in developing countries with support and financing. It's a market facilitator. We're going to rally the entrepreneurs, the right entrepreneurs, the skilled professionals, the funders, the philanthropists, put them around and get them to work, to communicate, to collaborate on the projects they choose. We're going to allow people to go around and see the portfolio of projects from the entrepreneurs and be part of their teams online and put an infrastructure that allows these virtual team rooms to let them collaborate. It's a mission-driven initiative. It is not a charity, but we want to achieve high social impact with sound financial return that will ensure the sustainability of these projects that will have that impact. Now, what's the role of you guys in there? Well, what I'd like you to be is part of that community, is join and put your skills. And for the corporations that have CSR departments, they can also fund the projects and help these entrepreneurs succeed. What would you get out of it? Well, first of all, the resources, the CSR resources, would be allocated effectively. I don't say it's more effective than what you do today. But having a number of reliable projects that have been screened by local microfinance institution credit officers that know what they're talking about, the good ones, we, we will select them, having a portfolio of credible projects that have social, high social impact. And also involve the employees of these corporations in the CSR initiatives. Getting these employees through a crowdsourcing mechanism to select the project that you are going to support and get, transform a number of CSR activities into actual corporate culture, and actual initiatives embedded in the corporate culture, involving, say, 300 people in the institution going around and selecting. These people can also follow the progress of the projects they choose. That platform will have feedback, regular feedback, in forms of blogs, indicators, indicators that will be audited by people locally, and you will be able to follow the progress, and the employees in the companies will be able to follow the progress, taking that link, that bond, further than just the initial selection. The employees will be able to follow the project and also to interact in those virtual team rooms. If you have a, a, somebody that really has the skills that can help Paola, who's trying to sell her goods, or Alcia, who's trying to make the best cocoa beans in the world, or um, Guillermo, that wants to extract capsaicina to sell it to the pharmaceutical industry, and they have the skills that could help one of these entrepreneurs, they could actually contribute those skills and help it move forward. And by contributing those skills, you also help the development of these employees. Imagine someone in a large 100,000 people corporation. Entrepreneurship in there is quite a weird concept. But you take that same person, you put him as a board member online in that virtual team room for a specific project, and he follows that project, and contributes a few hours for the board meetings, that person is going to learn what entrepreneurship is about, what impact is about. So it's also about training the people. It's not giving, it's gaining together. That's Bamboost. Mic is oh, there, um, and I'll tell somewhat of a of a different story, um, but similar. There's there's a few explosions in in my story. Um, in 1989, Con Edison in New York exploded a steam pipe in Gramercy Park where I lived and sprayed 220 pounds of asbestos wrapping and killed three people. And up until that time, I'd been um, a wild gotcha real estate lawyer and a Hong Kong merchant banker. And I wondered why do cities explode? And it turned out that New York City had a bunch of different digital maps that didn't talk to each other. Each agency had a different map, somewhat like the functions of banks that don't talk to each other. And I thought, well, um, 1989, 1990, what if I uh, 
instigate New York City to map itself from bedrock to the top of the trade towers. And New York City, being New York City, said, I'm not going to do that so fast, Bruce. Um, we have our fiefdoms. Um, and I, because I'm a bond lawyer, figured out that there was $100 million in the capital budget of the city that could pay to coordinate all of these maps into a composite map. And I thought I'd take a year and, and make that uh, contribution to the city. And it took nine years. And I formed a, a, a nonprofit, Urban Logic, and Ashoka recognized me for that work, and I'm an Ashoka Fellow. Um, then um, testified before Congress. 9-11 uh, happens, and I have a digital data directory to the city of New York. Um, and suddenly I say, how can I help? And they say, why did you call? Get down here. And I go down. And um, they, um, and for the next three months, I'm at the command center, the mayor's command center. And you've seen many pictures of it. And I'm making sure that the, the mayor and the emergency responders can be safe uh, at ground zero. And I notice that for the first time in my 25 years in New York City, New Yorkers are actually helping each other. And I'm like, this, this is crazy. I mean, yes, it's self-preservation, but why did it take 3,000 lives, two big buildings, and 19 terrorists to do this? It's crazy. And so um, what if instead of that, what if instead of that, we had a way to, um, to estimate or to rank, if you will, and I think this is a different set of slides, but we'll get, get you there. There. Ah, good. Um, what if we had a different way of ranking individual effort, something I call sustainable resiliency, so that every organization and every person operating in New York or in uh, any other region would see that what they're doing is actually affecting the quality of life of the place that they care about. And that quality of life either it goes up or goes down, is threatened, is improved. Um, that sustainable resiliency could be a currency or it could be a credit rating. And then I had the, um, the emotional question, do I form a credit rating agency, which sometimes has to give bad ratings to people who deserve it, and then you have a conflict of interest. Um, or I could form a bank, and I decide to form a bank. And what if such a bank were called Good Bank? And the bank actually gave people credit based on what they do to improve the quality of life. Now, they don't have to improve it across the board because some things that they do may improve public health or some may improve environment or some may improve um, uh, food and nutritional issues. But that's all right. Um, en masse, if people could see through the bank that they're actually having that impact, the bank could reward them and could penalize them where appropriate, not because the bank decided the ethical norm, but because the customer did. And the customer was using the bank to see their impact on society. Then the more interesting thing happened, um, which is, again, apologies for an old slide deck here. Um, I started to look at the safety and soundness ratings, the CAMELS ratings, that the regulators apply to the, the banking system as a whole. But I ran into a barrier. It is, as an, it is illegal for any US bank to release its safety and soundness ratings from its regulator. It's illegal. So we had to, at Stanford, with, working with some colleagues, come up with a synthetic uh, CAMELS rating. CAMELS standing for Capital Assets management, earnings, liquidity, and systemic risk. And what you see on this chart is a lot of messy lines. But you see 20 years of four banks' camels' performance, as this model would estimate it. And you see a red line. And if I can point, um, the red line is Shorebank. It represents Shorebank in Chicago. And Shorebank in Chicago starts above the peer norm of safety and ends up closed last year. And another bank, Wainwright, near, 
near uh, Boston, is below peer norm, and ends up sa as safe uh, under this model as Silicon Valley Bank, one of the best managed banks. Both Wainwright and Shorebank are community development banks, civil rights era banks. And the question in my mind is, what if we showed this to people as part of our high transparency experience at Good Bank? What if you could say, yes, the impact you're having on quality of life, but you could also see that by taking an interest in the quality of life and using your money safer, you made the bank safer. Instead of banks hiding the impact that their customers are having on their safety and soundness, they let them see it. That level or multi-dimensional level of transparency is very unique and we're gonna try that. And I just uh, want to observe my own time. Um, I think it's important that you see that banks are dealing with this problem, which is that for some reason, the non-performing loan experience of banks is four plus percent. But for microfinance institutions is uh, somewhat half of that. Banks have a lot of learning to do and a lot of transparency that can help them get there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I'll ask Stan as well to share his story. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to have been invited by SWIFT. Uh, we're kind of a new player in um, the, the realm of finance because we really come from the world of social networks. Um, so my personal story is that I grew up in a very idyllic little town in Arizona. And this town was sort of half hippies and half cowboys. And I think that that kind of um, sort of sunk in a little bit. Um, when I was a kid, I started working very young, um, like 11 or 12 years old. And one of my first jobs was as a paperboy, and I was actually a paperboy for quite a long time. And I learned, um, I think, the core fundamental that eventually became the digital currency that we now run based off our social network called Venn. And the core principle was about barter. <laughs> so every day at the end of my paper route, I would have a couple of papers left over. And being a kind of not very rich kid, uh, I wanted to figure out a way to kind of use those extra papers to gain some level of value. So over the course of the two or three or four years that I had my paper out, that was leveraged into anything from like an airplane ride through to dental work from the local dentist that lived on my paper out. And the people that were sort of on my paper out, a lot of them were older. And so that sort of translated into cakes and cookies and just about anything else you could stuff in your bag at Christmas. But I, I learned a lot from those people. And really the idea that sort of became one of the core fundamental principles of Hub Culture, which is the social network that we launched in 2002, uh, was about the power of the community and the groups of people who were part of that community to create value for each other. And so this is really the core fundamental of Hub Culture. I was at Time Warner for a long time. I worked at Fortune Magazine and uh, CNN Money. And during that time, we really had a different type of currency, and that was magazine pages. So doing the marketing, I often, again, didn't have big budgets, but I used uh, the magazine sometimes to be able to create events and projects all around the world using the magazine pages as a kind of barter currency. So when I left in 2007 to work on Hub Culture, the idea of currency and barter was really at the top of my mind. And even though we had started the, the community quite some time before, I kind of did it at night. Um, when I left to work on it full time, within six months we'd launched Venn. And so Venn was one of the first peer-to-peer -peer digital currencies. Um, it was the first digital currency to move out of gaming systems, where currencies have been very popular, and into the real economy, into the real world. So you may have heard of things like Second Life or World of Warcraft, which are both gaming systems. They trade billions of dollars a month in virtual currency related to virtual goods and services. So you can buy a digital sword, or you can buy gold, or whatever kind of gaming things. With us, we really took this into the real economy and we said we have a community of people. Hub culture was based on the idea of kind of people who were almost post-national in the way that they thought. So that kind of 10% in Sao Paulo and Tokyo and Paris and London and Singapore who had a lot in common with each other. 
And these people needed a way to, to be able to collaborate and to connect with each other. So when we launched the currency, it first became a means of exchange for the members of the community. And so they could trade that uh, currency peer to peer, and eventually they could buy it. So it wasn't too long after we launched it that we realized that for a currency to work, it needs to have some level of relative value. So we set the value at 10 to 1. And then as we continued on that journey, we started thinking that maybe there's a way to actually make currency better, and maybe to make it a little bit more sustainable, and hopefully not just better for the currency and for the people who use it, but for the planet at large. And that led to a fundamental breakthrough that happened in 2009. Um, ben became the first digital currency to move to a basket. And so that basket includes other currencies, commodities, and most crucially, carbon futures. So what this has created is a currency that is very, very stable, fundamentally, and also somewhat green, so that it has a little bit of a sustainable uh, bent to it in a way that you can actually use the currency um, and potentially do a little bit of good, not just for yourself and for your community, but for the planet by using it. So when I talk about this idea of a basket, um, this is essentially a kind of a boring financial thing, but it's a bunch of things that are lumped into a single average price. And that single average price is then compared against everything else in the market. So our members, we have about 25,000, use the currency to exchange value and knowledge among each other. And then they use it to purchase goods and services on our platform. So you can buy anything from an all-electric Nissan Leaf through to a piece of contemporary art. And increasingly, we're moving it towards institutional and financial level trading. So we want to make then available for all of you and for the institutions that you work with to have an alternative uh, source of liquidity and currency that can be used for trades. So to that end, this spring we did the first commodity trade priced in digital currency for gold. And then we did the first carbon credit trades for uh, projects with Nike that are actually helping to add towards reforestation in the Amazon. So we're really excited about the movement and the growth that Ben is experiencing. And we're really trying to create ways for that to become useful in a really positive way for the financial world. Um, with that in mind, uh, we've actually partnered, we're announcing today that Thomson Reuters is going to be uh, having Venn on their platform. So after next week, over 500,000 terminals will have Venn. Uh, Thank you, Scott. Uh, so we're not really sure what that means, and I think you guys will know what that means more than us. But we think and hope that it will actually lay some pathways for thinking about new ways to use currency. Venn is about twice as stable as a single currency on the financial markets, so it helps to alleviate exchange rate or um, hedging or exchange rate risk and hedging. And most crucially, it puts upward demand on carbon, which makes it easier to pay for protecting the oceans, forests, and other natural habitats. Thanks. Thank you. So three different solutions, a network, a bank, and a currency. In preparation for this session, we actually drew together a model to show a little bit what we want to work on. And this model is just over there, and I'm gonna ask the camera if possible to project it on the screens. There's two parts of this model. There's the mainstream banks, and I'm just gonna move there so you can move your chairs to look. There's the mainstream stream banks, which are all this stuff here. That's the mainstream banking system. And then there's the social banking system, which is emerging on the side. And there's different players in the two, and they're quite similar, but not exactly. One of the things in this ecosystem here is that it's very well integrated. It's a system that deals with global things. It, it has global infrastructures. It can deal with global problems. This one here, unfortunately, isn't there yet. There's many global problems there, and they're trying to solve those global problems, but there's only local solutions. The other thing that you see is those little connectors that happen between the two systems. There are a few. Primarily, there's a few financial instruments that exist today in order to allow the mainstream banking system to connect to the social banking system. And then there's a few other things on the side which are totally disconnected, like all those people that are unbanked and unconnected, which are quite a large number. So what we're gonna do in the next 40, 45 minutes is we'll ask you to look at the system and see what you observe in it and what you think are opportunities in this system for the mainstream banking
to become more sustainable, more responsible, to encourage better businesses. Each one of you got a number when you came in, right? No, those that don't have a number, over there, there'll be some ladies that will be handing you numbers, or otherwise I will, uh, I'll put you in a team. That number is the number of the team you're gonna join. We'll just rearrange the room very quickly and put around boards with team numbers on them. So find the board with the number <coughs> that you have. When you get there, you will find your assignment. Read it carefully and spend the next 40 minutes thinking about what you see in this picture. I'm gonna print copies of it and bring you so you can use it at your board. Who doesn't have a number? Just come here. In that part of the room, we cannot work at the tables. Can I have the music please? Okay, we're going to wrap up, so please take your seats, please. So all the groups take your, uh, re your conclusions with you. And we're going to actually close this session by asking each of you to wrap up and give us a summary of what you discussed. Short summary. <laughs> okay, I know this is an exciting subject, ladies and gentlemen, but can we please have you back at your seats, please? Okay, we have a few more people wandering around, but I think we're getting everybody back here. Good. All right, we, I, can, I can be very dictatorial about this and say team one, team two, team three, but I would prefer to let you choose when you want to stand up and actually present. Um, we have 10 minutes left until the end of this session, so we have eight teams to go. So really please focus on the highlights of your discussion uh, and, the, and really the striking point that we all need uh, to know. And who wants to go first? You do? Team five, team five. come on Alain then. Team five is up. Okay. Two things, actually, actually one thing. We don't get it. There's a lack of clarity. We don't understand what's on the, the left side. We don't understand what these pockets do. And until we understand them, we don't know the needs we can face. So the first thing is to really get clarity. Once this is addressed, we'll be able to identify the true needs of these people that we can help. And once this is addressed, we need to set up an approach to allow the traditional banks to apply their skills, their resources, to the needs that we will understand once we get clarity. And Examples of how to apply that would be something like Banks Without Borders, something that takes on the, the individual that is representing the bank to address those needs. But the very first thing is clarity, and until we get that clarity, we're in the dark, of course. Thank you very much, team number five. Who was in that team? Okay. <laughs> Who wants to go next? Now you're going to all go. Yeah, we, we, yeah. We were fighting, but <laughs> yeah. I just had a while. I wanted to get our points out before the other team. This is so team number four. So that I have something to say, right? <laughs> because otherwise they're going to get it out. So I think w w our team came to quite, quite an interesting conclusion, which is the following. Um, and I think we're going to be a little bit um, uh, sort of stir things up a little bit. It, it's very clear the system is broken on the, on the right-hand side. We know that. Otherwise, UBS wouldn't have happened a week ago. So we have a really massive problem on the right-hand side. And that is the big problem that I think we first need to think about fixing. And where we think there's a, there's a role, it's the role for the regulators. The regulators have a role to punish those miscreants for the undesirable side effects that they create when things like what happened a week ago happened. Because today, frankly, they, we, our, our view is they all go unpunished. 
And for as long as they go unpunished, you have an asymmetric risk profile that that system works in. And the minute you make a, a symmetric risk profile, what we'll see is the ability to create sustainable, high social impact businesses with good economic returns on the left-hand side of that diagram. And the minute you do that, you're gonna be able to create a capital bridge between the right-hand side and the left-hand side because you can get good returns on both sides and people will realize on a risk-adjusted basis that the returns on the right-hand side may even be better than the left-hand side. We don't believe that you can force the right-hand side to behave in a socially responsible manner because they haven't demonstrated the ability to do so over the last 30 or 40 years. And nothing's gonna change that overnight. So they're gonna have to be forced into a situation where economically they'll behave rationally. And the only way that we can do that is with the regulators. So, so that was our two minutes worth. Okay, who was in that team? Thank you very much. Okay. And we have an eager team coming up, okay? You were in team number two. two. Um, yes, you can. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, we, uh, we discussed, uh, when, we would, uh, when we were discussing, we, we felt that we could play certain uh, players in the mainstream financial system, at least the credit unions and the mutual banks, as transcending this, the two sides of the divide between the left and the, and the right, considering they do tend to know their consumers very, uh, a, a lot better, are in better p position to uh, provide uh, those kinds of credit. The second thing uh, that we came up with was, I, I mean, in this case, the bank is social. And the second uh, solution that we uh, thought of was that uh, we do something like lendingclub.com, which means that we take the loans, split them up, into hundreds of people who need to agree that this loan needs to be funded and, this, and socialize the loan evaluation or the credit evaluation amongst banks consumers, thereby giving the bank a window into knowing what its consumers, what industries the, its consumers care about. Uh, that would be a part of uh, a know your consumer. And the third thing uh, that we, uh, Thought, to, uh, thought of as the answer to the last question, which is the missing piece uh, in the system, is that uh, there is no, because of the lack of structure on the left side of, of that, in, uh, that diagram, there, there is no reliable rating, uh, credit rating system. And if, if we, may, uh, and, and the reason uh, micro lenders work is because they probably actually know the people they're actually giving credit to. So if that expertise could be socially integrated into a somewhat more reliable credit rating system that will not likely be perverted by an excess influx of money and the greed of higher pro profits that did happen to uh, the, uh, the other rating agencies, we could actually come up with aggregating the micro -lend lenders into something like a fund of funds, which then could be transferred to the right side of the of the picture. So those were the three things that we came up with. Okay, thank you team number two. Who was in that team? Okay, congratulations. <laughs> Next team, number, number six. You know, we ended up staying kind of at the meta level and had some great discussion. I, I think the thing that we all agreed upon is that there's a lack of understanding from side to side. Um, so that breeds a little bit of fear. And so, so we need a way to build transparency, you know, some sort of ratings agency or, or a way to grade. So um, if there's a request for capital from the right side to the left, what are you gonna do with that? Do I trust your new nonprofit organization? Um, similarly, the folks on the left need a way to trust their fear of the unknown of all of us here who travel all around the world and make lots of money, right, compared to their dollar a day. So it's a very human element, right? very fabric of fibre of social, it's community. It's, do I trust you? Do you trust me? And then can we work together, right? Thank you very much. Who was in this team? <laughs> Thank you. Who goes next? Team one.
Right, so we had some real expertise in our team, so I hope I can do it, uh, uh, do it justice. Uh, overall, it's quite clear that uh, on the left-hand side, <coughs> in the social side, as we uh, talked about it, uh, there's a lot of uh, bits and pieces missing. Uh, we talked about infrastructure and standards. We talked a little bit about rural ATMs and the final mile of actually getting the cash to individuals. We talked about regulation, and as the previous uh, group said, the absence of a ratings agency. Uh, regulation, very important because of, for example, what happened with microfinance in India when uh, the market was flooded. <coughs> Um, funding, um, and uh, we had the expertise of somebody who's actually about to launch a social stock exchange, so we didn't know what it was, and then had somebody who explained it to us. Um, visibility for institutional investors, with other words, um, getting the institutional investors who may well be interested in doing this uh, uh, easier access to what they could do uh, on that side. Instruments, uh, for example, something like the social impact bonds that uh, the UK government is, con uh, is considering with uh, returns paid on, uh, on outcome. And then finally, slightly controversially, we thought, well, either the right-hand side is going to have to get uh, into the mode of helping or it's going to get disintermediated. So the choice is get disintermediated, which is a very popular thing to say, of course, at Cybos, uh, or uh, offer some <laughs> talent, resources, and advice. <laughs> Thank you, team number one. Who was on that team? <laughs> okay, we're still missing one, two, three, four, five, three teams. So who comes next? Are we? Or was this all? Okay, I'll give you a mic then. Okay, but okay, fine. Thank you. So I will be very short. So I think what we concluded is that this uh, ecosystem has to be created in order to have more exchanges in between what we see on the left hand side, what we see on the right hand side. Okay. No Thank problem. you, Matteo. <laughs> So we were thinking actually of an active platform that would have to be created in order to create those exchanges, incentives for mainstream banking to invest in social banking. So it could be some government incentives or whatever. And then we also thought that, for example, the social banking uh, institutions or organizations, they could actually become advisors for the mainstream banks in sustainability through an active platform where, for example, an organization such as SWIFT could play an active role. Vice versa, also the mainstream banking can be advisors to the social banking organizations. And then we also saw that definitely, I mean, the outcome of all this is also for banks to invest more, to provide loans to the social banking organizations. Thank you very much, team number eight. Who was on that team? Are we missing any other teams? Or is another team so shy that they don't want to present their results? Yes, Joel. A short word on uh, theme three, but uh, essentially linking up Speak in to, your mic, uh, to a lot that has been said. Um, we looked at the, m the missing of trust uh, uh, between the two, uh, uh, the two sides here, the left and the right, uh, a, a lack of direct links, uh, and we also had a discussion on the interest. What is the interest to connect uh, both both sides? Uh, also had a, an interesting discussion on what is ongoing in India uh, and perhaps how India is already further in the connect than than the uh, Western world or than Europe uh, would be, and that we can certainly learn uh, out of that uh, on connecting uh, the uh, or have a higher connect. Uh, also as to the metrics uh, and, and the, uh, the connection uh, between the two, the two sides. Okay, thank you team number three. Who was on that team? Congratulations. <laughs> okay, I think we've covered almost all teams, haven't we? Or have we missed somebody? Okay, well. Now, uh, I think we're getting to the end of the uh, session, so Mela, would you take over? I just want to challenge you here a little bit. What can we do about all this stuff? I mean, there are some things that are pretty easy to be tackled. We don't understand. We need to get clarity. What's next? This was a great session, and we had a great session last year. We've already actually put a number of possible next things we could be doing, but I'm opening the floor to you. Anything. 
So what's on the board here are, we are going to have a virtual CYBOS on 19th of October. We could potentially organize a session with more banks even. And possibly with participants from the other side. In fact, we did the session at Ashoka with the other side. There were no, practically no banks there. There were only the social entrepreneurs. Now we're doing this side. So how about we do something together so that we open this dialogue? And at least at first create this clarity and understanding of what is this other side about? Why do we need to care to connect? Would that be something of interest? You need to put this topic up on the plenary stage with people to debate it because I think it's a very topical issue for the SWIFT community and I think it needs to be a real debate at that level. And on, you know that's what really needs to happen here, in my opinion. But <coughs> I'll echo what, what Udi was just saying. I mean, I think, uh, and this has been my mantra for the day, I mean, I, I increasingly feel uh, uh, that the topics that are being discussed in in our circus tent here are uh, the fundamental topics which are not getting explored in the main parts of Cybos. And, uh, um, and I think these topics are not fringe, they're not peripheral, they're very fundamental. Um, they're inextricably linked to what's happening with financial systems, what's happening with regulation, with uh, riots in London, and uh, this is real stuff, right? And so I think it should be on the main agenda and, and that we should, and I think SWIFT is in the right position to force the issue. Uh, I would like to add to that that it needs to be on the main agenda indeed, but it needs to be on the main agenda at two levels. At the level of thinking and understanding the big picture, but also on acting on a number of initiatives, and we've heard some of them here, that can bring impact right away in pockets and see what can happen. What can happen if we really move, if we really deliver, and in parallel, understand the overall situation and what we can do about it on longer term. Anybody else want to? Yep. Just, just to pick up on, on the point, and I think you're right. Um, this is a language problem. This is a language problem. It's not that this is a separate tent. This is the tent of the real economy that the other folks think they can outsmart by structure. And they can't. And they've learned that in so many ways, but they haven't said it to th themselves. So our tent, and what I showed you in that messy slide, we have a language we've developed using their metrics of safety and soundness that can say, if you follow us, if you create a couple of prototypes, if you work with us to understand your systems, we can go toe to toe and see whether your way of doing things, your machines for generating capital, look at all as safe as th these machines. Because the machines, we're the virtual mas machines as you know them, I'm thinking, collaborative machines. These machines have human hands all over them, constantly validating or unvalidating the, the, the path that they're taking. So I think we can use their science of proving if they're on the right path and, and, and stand up a couple of examples, whether it's a bank simple or a good bank or a bamboos or, or you know all of these ideas and many, many more let's grade them accordingly and take the, the leap of a venture fund and, and throw some money out there and say, what is the next generation and how are we going to mentor that? Okay. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else wants to make a comment? Yeah, uh, basically yes. to echo that. I also think we need a few more of them in here, uh, the people that don't think like us to basically debate with and uh, just get a few more opposing perspectives and see why they don't think this will work. Okay. So what we propose actually, since it seems to be a consensus that we need to continue this conversation in one way or another, we're gonna pass around actually a ball. Whoever is interested to continue this conversation, please put your business card in there. And this is your sign as well that we can contact you to organize something following. We will put in this conversation the other side as well. So thank you very much for this session.
and hope to continue this conversation with all of you.